Okay, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Finn. I work for GSB Sumo. No matter how much I hate saying Sumo. Um, but they, uh, they paid for me to do a, a PhD part time at, at the University of Bradford. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time collecting and then thinking of better ways of collecting geophysical data, trying to spend less time walking up and down. Um, a quick kind of extra introduction. Um, this is it's partly my work at GSB and it's also partly uh, some of the, the way I've been feeding that work back into kind of open, uh, open archaeological geophysical uh, processing frameworks um, as part of Occupy at, at the University of Bradford uh, alongside um, Chris Harris and quite a few other PhD and, and master students. Um, I should say that none of us are computer programmers, we're geophysicists, archaeologists um, who have learned to do any kind of computer programming in, a, in largely our own time to try to solve irritating, tedious problems. Um, so a quick introduction to sure, all of you, or at least most of you will be aware that this is, this is largely what geophysics at least used to look like, walking around with Bartington's doing tedious framework uh, Resistive surveys or pushing heavy GPR kits around fields. Um, I'd say fairly recently, over the past few years, uh, most geophysical units seem to be moving towards um, GNS located surveys. So stuff like cart based magnetometers, cart based resistivity frames, or tractor towed multi channel GPR systems. <coughs> generally increasing level of expense as you go up that list, um, which has presented quite a few problems. Pretty much all the geophysical softwares uh, are based on gridded data collection. So they look like stuff on the left hand side. So these are 40 meter grids, thing expected to be collected on nice parallel straight lines. Um, and you do all your processing in grid based formats. Uh, the part of it is that most stuff, I'm missing an arrow there, is a, most of the software is just a general kind of black box. You push your data in, you push the button, you might be able to change a couple of parameters uh, and then you get some data out. It all looks very nice, but how often do you actually know what's happened in between? And definitely, uh, especially now using kind of Windows 8 and stuff like that, that, that error message at the bottom is increasingly common and increasingly irritating. Um, on top of that, if we're just using stuff that we would use to process gridded data, we don't get to take advantage of all the extra features we get out of the GPS. So this is, this is uh, some magnetometer data draped over a topo map that's collected real time. So we have magnetometer data with perfectly located GPS data, and we can drape a nice grayscale over a color contour. And you can see that the one nice archaeological feature sits nicely on the brow of this hill all the rest of the geology, you kind of go, oh, that's, that's the reason that disappears. That's, that is where that steep cliff drops off. Oh, I, think I remember dragging the cart up and down that. Um, so if we're going from our gridded software to uh, kind of GPS-based software, why do we want open source? And there should be some more images. So if I think of our old software, we spent a lot of money on it, uh, and now we can't really use it. But if we're to use open source software, uh, it's free at point of sale. You can use it on any operating system. We can try to get away from this. This app can't run on your PC because we have all the code. We can recompile it for the next operating system without having to rewrite it all from scratch. And why Python? Because well, it's really easy. Um, and it has the obligatory XKCD comics. I'd like, yeah, definitely is that easy. Um, as well as that, someone else has generally already done all the hard work that you're trying to avoid doing. So this is uh, this is some stats uh, taken a couple of months ago from the NumPy module for Python, which is numerical processing. Um, and my favorite bit is the bottom of this gray box. It says that uh, so far the there's been an estimated 67 years worth of effort that's gone into this individual bit of software. No one, no one of us could dedicate 67 years to an individual bit of software. Um, 
so other people have already done this kind of hard work for us. And it's not just numerical things like that, it's also all the plotting libraries. Uh, libraries we can use to make shapefiles, modify shapefiles. So, if I get on to... I rewrote this talk slightly based on a, a conversation I overheard. Um, someone saying, oh, I was interested in going to CAA, but I read through the abstracts and none of them said, this is a bit of software I want to use. Uh, this is how you do it. And so they decided they didn't want to come along because they weren't really sure if they were just going to listen to an academic kind of conversation or actually learn something, learn how to do something. So I thought I'd take some of our, some of our recently collected data and explain how we uh, go about converting stuff. So if I start with some coordinate transformations. We take uh, GPS data, collect it on a nice orthogonal grid, and then we want to put that onto a Google Earth. And Google Earth is round, uh, whereas the grids we lay out in the field, hopefully, are nice and square. Uh, and that produces errors. So you might notice on this data up here that some of those grids seem to overlay walls uh, and things like that. So when you actually try to project this data just straight off onto a Google Earth, it appears in the wrong place, um, which caused quite a lot of emails going back and forth going, this is definitely right. I oh, know it's, oh, no, it's not right. That's why it's not right. Um, but if we're doing coordinate transformations, it means we can take our GPS data, we can overlay it on Google Earth data, or we can overlay it on OpenStreetMap data, all of which use slightly different coordinate systems. So, how do we do that? Some of it, originally we might want to go through something like Notch.js or use a, a web-based um, reprojection system, but we can do that very easy, easily in, in Python. So, those six lines on the right-hand side of the screen, which take WGS84 data, so latitude and longitude, uh, and convert it to OSGB36. If we want to then convert straight into uh, national grid data coordinates, people have already written bits of Python code which we can we can take offline. Uh, there's some BGS stuff, uh, and then it's an extra line to go from just being a number to something we can easily use on a map. Um, we move on from just uh, reproject, reprojecting uh, data points um, and actually look at transforming images. So at, at GSB, we had uh, we had a load of old soil maps. Uh, I think they're dated 1982. Uh, we looked at buying some digital copies of this, uh, these maps and we were quoted 25,000 pounds. We went, I can't really justify that. We'll just have to keep looking in the box and digging out that. Um, and then we had a placement student come along um, who wanted to look at some of this data. So it's like, okay, well, I mean, we're only going to use it internally. Let's, uh, let's scan all this data in so we've got a, a backup of it, and then we can think about doing something more. So these are a couple of the, a couple of the scans of, of sections of this, these soil maps, um, which we can then use openly available uh, GDAL. So we can use GDAL merge to take our 120 small composite images, turn them into a two gig TIFF file that's still geo-referenced, uh, and then we can use something like GDAL tiles, which is another Python script openly available online. Um, and we can take all of those, all that one, tera, uh, one gigabyte uh, TIFF file, we can turn it into a leaflet type map with WMS layers, overlay it on Google Earth or OpenStreetMap or anything like that. Uh, we can add a search bar that queries um, Google Map Engine and type in place names or postcodes. And rather than having to go into the back office, digging up, go, oh, do I want to be on map sheet four? Oh yeah, I do, right, okay. Now where do we leave that, that uh, index of all the numbers so we know what type of soil map that is? We can, we can just go and, and query it straight away and we can do that anywhere from within the office. Okay, so we can also use Python or and also open source hardware to collect all of our data out in the field. So you saw an image earlier of um, GSB's cart system, and this is the complexity of our data logger. That is a Raspberry Pi, 
Um, and that's about as complex as it gets. The software which runs on that is just a Linux-based open source um, operating system, which just runs a Python script on boot and listens to serial data coming in. So we just log data from our GPS, we log data from our Boddington data loggers, or we can log data from any kind of first data loggers or any other system pretty much that we can find. We can just plug in, a, plug in a, an extra USB to serial, plug in an extra serial port, tape it up a little bit so that nothing shakes too much, and there we have it, we can, we can log. I mean, at the moment, we're logging uh, eight channels of magnetometer data and two GPS feeds at all of them at 10 hertz, saving it onto a USB disk, and we haven't, haven't hit any problems yet. But then that gives us 500 files, which look like this. So this is the data which comes out of our GPS, timestamp, a long string that when I try to explain to most of the other people in the office, I just go, what's that? Oh, I don't know what that is. I don't have time to look at any of that. Just, just turn it into something that looks nice. So how do we get from that to a nice map of some really tedious geophysical data with a lovely uh, pipe for it? Um, how do we overlay any of our GPS traces so that we know where we need to go back and collect that, that missing line to really find out exactly where that pipe goes? So to start off with, we need to take our GPGGA coordinates and turn them into something useful that we can, we can use. That's a little bit trickier than I originally hoped because GPGGA includes letters, whereas PyProj has a fit if you give it anything with letters in it. So you've got to start kind of extracting just individual numbers, converting them into decimal coordinates. But there we are, it's there. It's not, well, it was a little bit of trial and error and then and we're fine. Then we need to use some, do some 2D image interpolation. So we need to take our individual points, turn them into an image. And again, this, this is an image just taken straight off of um, Psyche Images uh, explanation of how to plot uh, irregular data points onto a map of lib. So we can investigate whether it's better to use our nearest neighbor linear cubic rather than having to go and buy a copy of Surfer or anything like that. We can Never play around. And then we can, we don't want that data just to be on, a, on an image, we want to be able to interrogate that as a, as a kind of CAD file, so we can then use the same open source uh, DXF libraries to save all of our data out as, as straight CAD files, or we can do the same and save them out as using Shapely as uh, shape files, which we can interrogate in either CAD or GIS or anything like that. Um, this is one of my, my favorite things that we, originally we weren't really making best use of our topographic data that we were collecting because we had to collect GPS all the time. We had 10 hertz GPS data coming in from RTK GPS, so we had really good topo data. Why weren't we making better use of that? Um, we can make it into a nice kind of color image and drape our grayscale over it, but did we really gain a lot from that? Did it really help our interpretation? But we can we can make a we can use Map.lib and we can extract contours out of that. As long as you dig deep enough in the API, there's information about that. And then we can save that out as DXF and we can interrogate that in, in CAD again. Um, and then we saw this data earlier. Um, in gray and stuff we can we can then use open source KML producing libraries to take our images, they're already georeferenced, drop them onto a KML. I've hidden a little bit above that that automatically uh, uploads all of our images to a secure Amazon Web Storage website so that that data is available outside of our office. We can, we can just send a KMZ file out to a client rather than taking a day to drop data into the right place on a CAD, on CAD, printing it out, or PDFing it, emailing it across, sorting out all the scales. We can now instantly send our clients a, a KMZ file. They can, they can view their data real time, essentially. They get in it, they get in it, a KMZ at the end of every day showing what data we've collected that day. So, that's a little bit caught faster than I was hoping. Well, okay. Um, how can you get involved? Um, I'm trying to move as much uh, of the stuff I produce at, at GSB into to our Archaeopy repository. We're getting there. A lot of it ends up being written in a kind of 
dreaded emergency. Oh no, I need to get that done for tomorrow. And then we have to go back and, uh, and comment it all out and et cetera. But slowly we're, we're starting to move it all over into a, into a GitHub, GitHub repository. Um, we're producing bits of code in the university directly into this GitHub repository. Um, and that's all available at that website. There's a uh, Google Groups kind of thing where any code that I've written that hasn't been documented, you can send an email and go, how does this work? I don't know, I'll have to go back and have a look at that. Um, and uh, So you can access and contribute to our repository. If you have any exciting Python code that I'm, I'm not aware of, or then uh, you can access it and, and help us with that. So yeah, some more uh, of the, the links to the kind of um, modules we're using. And yeah, any questions or any suggestions for better ways of doing stuff?